Hi everyone. Thanks again for dialing into today's webinar. So my name's Louisa and I'll be taking you through this first session on barriers to innovation. Just a little reminder, please do ensure your phones or computers are muted. We will be recording the webinar today and that just helps us avoid any background noise. If you do have any questions, please feel free to type them into the chat panel on the right hand side or tweet them to us using the hashtag um, NMR webinar and we'll come back to these at the end. Uh, just in the interest of time, we might not be able to get through all the questions, but we, I will make sure I come back to you individually if I don't get around to answering your questions today. Uh, my colleague Vicky is also on hand, so please do um, let her know through the chat panel if you have any, quest any technical issues or any questions around the running of the webinar. Okay, so today's session should take around 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, it's the first in a series of five webinars, all focusing on ensuring that innovation processes in manufacturing organisations are as effective as they possibly can be. So my name is Louise, as I mentioned earlier, and I've been at MMR for 10 years this week, actually. And in this time, I've worked on a number of um, big accounts, so I've seen firsthand the issues that can be faced throughout the innovation process by our clients and also how um, agency partners can help our clients to overcome these potential issues. So today we're going to be focusing on barriers to innovation. It's important to be mindful of these so we know what to look out for throughout the process and to be able to improve our chances of success by overcoming them. We'll go on to look at the sources of inspiration for innovation, how to and some top tips for building blocks for successful innovation, common research traps, and then some potential MMR solutions across the remaining four webinars over the rest of June and July. Okay, so we don't have to tell you that innovation really isn't easy. In fact, consumers have a biological preference towards the familiar, which means that actually the success of new products is actually um, even more difficult and failure is almost the default. This is unfortunately really, really obvious in the high proportion of new products which then go on to fail in market, even within the first six months of launch. We believe that companies need to be more clever to break the cycle. Having a great product alone is just not enough anymore. All aspects of the proposition need to be carefully crafted in harmony to be in with the, even the smallest chance of succeeding. But also, there's not a simple answer. There's not a one-size-fits-all approach to innovation. So the main focus of this series is to really give you the inspiration to improve your own innovation approach and help maximise success overall. So this quote, if you go on doing what you've always done, you'll go on getting what you've always got, apparently attributed to Albert Einstein. It just goes to show that it might not be broke, but time out to consider the innovation process may only help to improve it. So just being mindful of what you're doing as an organisation, what might work, better than um, other things, will just help you make sure that you're on any innovation project you embark on, you're putting the right tools in place to make sure you've got a higher chance of success. So I'm going to ask you to all actually take part in a little exercise during this webinar. So it's tricky to be interactive during a webinar, but we do have a chat panel on the right hand side and the hashtag MMR webinar available to us. So during the next um, section, it'd be great if you could please just uh, tweet or type into the chat panel any companies which you personally think are particularly innovative. So these can be across any different category or sector. I'm just interested in seeing your thoughts on which companies are innovative. And we'll come back to these at the end of today's session. So just a quick background on, on MMR and why, why we're in a good place to talk to you today about effective innovation. Our focus is uh, predominantly working with food, drink, personal and household care manufacturers. 
As a result, we've got a really good understanding of the challenges which they face. In, in fact, it's essential that we do if we're even going to get even slightly close to our, our aim of helping them to make perfect products. We want to help our clients make products which truly delight consumers through delivery of a really rewarding emotional experience. And in order to achieve that, you have to start right at the beginning of the very innovation process and keep that in mind throughout the whole, um, whole journey. So our core heartland is looking at turning the promise into effective product and pack delivery, which will really resonate with consumers, giving them a sense of reward. This sense of reward is vital to have a chance of repeat sales because it delivers consumers a level of satisfaction um, at an even a quite implicit level, which will help build brand loyalty and eventually drive long-term success. So the bringing together of the promise of product and pack is something that we'll come back to in a later webinar, but it's something to keep in mind as we go through. And so we've we talk, spoken to all our directors to get their opinions both um, throughout the UK, US, and uh, China, and really built on their experiences from working with our clients to really understand what challenges they face. So these perspectives that we've brought together today, and we'll be sharing with you the common barriers and themes that have been communicated to us and that we've experienced firsthand through working with these clients. We've seen what works through and being involved in many successful launches, so just a, a handful of examples here. But we've also learned through working with clients on launches that haven't quite gone to plan. Um, so, for example, Nature's Pleasure by Kellogg's was unfortunately scrapped. Uh, they had a great product, great idea, they knew their target market, but unfortunately a few things came together at the point of activation which stopped it being a successful market. And they've actually re-entered the Simply Wholesome market in the UK more recently, and they're seeing much more success. Likewise with Sensations, it's arguably a very successful brand, and very well known in the UK. Um, but actually, about five years ago, they had to revisit the brand to make sure that everything they were doing were really um, enhancing the, the positioning and just having some interesting flavours wasn't enough to actually build this exotic and premium position that they were striving for. So move, more recent moves such as um, launching flavours such as smoked Monterey chilli with goat's cheese instead of something a bit more traditional like roast chicken and thyme helped Sensations to really um, to consolidate their position and maintain a competitive edge. One thing that is consistent is that the real and long-term success, it's products where everything really connects together that tend to be longer lasting, even if that actually means a, short, a, a trade off in short-term appeal during the MPD process. So in terms of the barriers, the way in which the potential barriers to success are manifest does really vary a lot from business to business. But through working with our clients, we have observed common themes which can hinder the ability to actually achieve perfection. So we've been able to use this understanding to develop a guiding set of core principles which can help prevent market research as being one of the barriers to success. And we'll come on to this in a later session. But firstly, we need to be aware of these external and internal barriers to make sure that we can be looking out for them throughout the innovation process some are unavoidable, but we need to be able to know uh, what they are so we can work around them. So the first step we're going to look at are the external challenges. These are the hurdles to innovation presented by the broader marketplace that our directors have come across time and time again when partnering with their FMCG clients, not just in the UK but all over the world, and there's a lot of commonalities even in the developing market. These, in essence, represent the new normal. They put pressure on the MPC process, but to some extent they're out of the control of the people we're working with. As we can see here, there's numerous barriers. So it's, it just goes to show and reiterate the point that innovation really isn't easy. 
So we've grouped these into three main areas, saturation, diversification, and acceleration. So if I take saturation to start with, definitely the marketplace is full of good products. So products on the supermarket shelves are on the whole fit for purpose. Consumers, particularly in Western economies, um, have so much choice available to them. From a psychological perspective, consumers place a certain value on consistency, even if it is less conscious. There's so much choice available to them, but actually having favourites just makes their life easier. Generally, what we've got is good enough, so we're not really actively seeking new products. Um, and actually, new products almost need to be pattern interrupters in order to cut through that noise in the store. Linked to this, Consumer needs are, on the whole, met. It's really difficult these days to actually identify a totally new need, which isn't being currently met by existing products. Based on this, we've seen a real move towards companies starting from either a new ingredient or technology, and then using research to determine how to sell it to consumers to seek differentiation, as opposed to looking for a, a new need state or occasion and targeting that. And this becomes a new source of innovation because the obvious new product format, flavors, packaging routes, etc., are often taken. Coupled with the uh, consumer saturation or shopper saturation, there's also a large degree of competition for shelf space with intense retailer pressure. And we should not underestimate the importance of the, the supermarket as a key battleground. So even perfectly executed and well-targeted products need to stand out and connect with people in store in order to succeed. Getting that presence on shelf is key, and the power is increasingly with retailers to decide where products um, should and should not get listed. Consumers' repertoires are also pretty established. So it's difficult to compete for share, even if people express interest in a new, a new um, product they're naturally risk adverse. So it comes back to this preference for things that are familiar, even if it's at a subconscious level. The average family buys two to three cereals, 70% buy what they always buy, and the average time in um, the aisle is just 60 seconds. If you think about that compared to the proliferation of products available to them, you can see again why it's so tricky to cut through. Diversification is the second area. So uh, we see increasingly our clients are facing challenges from having a global uh, company but trying to achieve local focus and trying to win at both. Um, it's, it's really tricky to perfectly coordinate but also often means compromise. Coupled with this is the diversification of channels. So people's shopping behaviour is not simple. It's not so easy to uh, gain attention in store anymore due to the different ways that people shop. The uh, increase in terms of top-up shopping compared to main grocery shops, rise of discounters, etc. All these, all these things make it more challenging to achieve successful innovation. Coupled with the um, proliferation of different media and communication routes to actually connect with the consumers, and also their changing wants and needs. Finally, acceleration. A lot of large businesses and cor corporations just aren't agile enough to cope with the speed in which trends come and go. So a great idea, one moment, may then not um, get to market quick enough to really capitalise on that trend. New products are also being delisted quickly and not given the chance to succeed. So if they don't achieve the initial sales rate, that are hoped for or promised for the retailer, then they're not given a chance to actually build and incrementally increase in terms of their success. I think linked to this as well is how successful innovation is actually defined, and the initial sale, sale rates are too often used as a gauge for success. Linked to the power of the retailers, we see increased pace of copying and threat from private label and an uh, ever-increasing standard of quality of private label products. And often they have the, um, the momentum behind them to be able to be more 
innovative and launch new packaging routes, for example. Consumers themselves are more savvy than they've ever been, and they have access to information very quickly on hand. Plus, news does travel very fast, so any any negative um, pushback linked to a new launch can quickly spread. It's also increasingly harder to build compelling claims and to really drive innovation through technological advancements. It's no longer the case that the big brands are able to uh, invest in new technology more easily in order to be innovative. And as I mentioned, the retailers here often um, even have more of an advantage. So these factors, they're unlikely to go away. And if anything, they will continue to pose more of a challenge to landing successful innovation. Therefore, they need to be embraced, and the whole innovation journey needs to reflect the state of the market accordingly to prevent these being barriers to success after launch. So whilst we're not going to go into solutions to these barriers today, it's all about making sure that we understand that they exist and keeping them in mind as we proceed through the innovation process. The second set of factors are internal challenges. So I'm sure, based on my experience, at least one of these will resonate with you as an issue within your business. The first one that we see very frequently is compromise during the product development and then finally at launch. So corners are cut, often for very good reason. There might be a change in the ingredient supplier, a slight change to packaging, um, slight um, variation in distribution, all little tweaks which alone wouldn't matter. And actually research might be conducted to prove that it's not impacting overall performance. However, when all combined at launch, this, uh, this combination of little tweaks can actually lead to a big impact on success. Of course, a lot of the manufacturers we work with, we see a real lack of joined up thinking across different departments. This is particularly an issue at innovation where you have teams working in silos, marketing team developing a fantastic concept, R&D busy making great products. But without collaboration and frequent collaboration, there may be a disconnect between the, um, the actual final proposition. This disconnect and um, also exists even in the language that they use, and that's something we do often see. So briefs between the two departments can um, lead to confusion and a lack of fit between the, the idea and the, the eventual product. Putting the consumer at the heart can provide a common language. And basing product and packaging design on not just marketing aims, but a deep rooted understanding of the consumer and how sensory delivery can link to the emotional and functional requirements of that consumer can help avoid this being an issue. Uh, it's also quite common for companies to guess, almost get hung up on the pursuit of mass appeal. So targeting ideas are liked by many, rather than looking for those options that are really loved by a few. And if the ideas that are truly loved are going to be more likely to succeed. Uh, even if it's more more niche in terms of the number of people that are potentially going to play it. Part of this is often driven by a need to keep the pipeline filled. So OK ideas can get progressed. In many large organisations, there's a fear of change or lack of flexibility available to people accompanied by rigid adherence to gate processes and achieving normative levels, which can often mean research becomes a barrier or a block and block to flare. Uh, it can prevent confidence in gut feeling and um, as a result, it really impacts potential for success. These processes are often in place and they're, they're in place for good reason, for consistency and reassurance of the business that an idea is going to be uh, have potential in market, but it, this can cause a lack of agility to, to react to those quick changing marketplace trends that we talked about earlier. Sometimes we also see that at a more personal level, individual agendas and internal politics can also get in the way. Uh, we've seen instances in which 
um, when results are surprising from consumer research, they might not be progressed in the best way for the consumer because they don't fit with the marketeer or a senior stakeholder's expectations of what the idea should be achieving. When there's too many stakeholders, this can also be an internal barrier to an innovation success. It can cause the overall message to be diluted throughout the process, lead to conflicting priorities, and also lack of ownership. It can just mean that things fall through the gaps or the um, lack of the real clarity around the path in which that should be taken can mean that um, the, idea, the original idea gets changed throughout the process and the end result is something quite different to the proposition that was intended at the start. Finally, a lack of scale or global linkage at this early innovation stage can lead to projects being dropped, not because they don't show potential, but because at an individual market level, they're too costly to progress with, particularly if they involve new factory plants or new investment in new technology. So by understanding the global potential and uh, looking into uh, global chances for launching new products, it can help bring the costs to be more manageable and stop good ideas being dropped because of the cost of implementation. So later in the series of webinars, we'll look at how some of these issues can be addressed through putting the consumer at the heart of the innovation process. So just to come back to the companies that you think are innovative, uh, we've had quite a few suggestions then, and just in hand of the list here. There's a few that have come up a few times, so Dyson, for example, is coming through quite often. Uh, noted for taking household appliances, but uh, doing them differently and better to improve the consumer experience. Had a couple of mentions of Robinson squashed, so the new concentrated um, squash for consumers, so that's seen as being particularly innovative. Um, Tesla Motors, the electric cars from the US, Seen as being something really innovative and quite different in that market. But Nissan also mentioned for their use of in car technology and in their adverts. Um, and then a number of um, online retailers also have come through. So a real range of different companies being described as being innovative. And as I would have expected to see, they're being called innovative for different reasons. So for some, it's the packaging. For some, it's actual product innovation, and for others, it's how they actually um, go about their, the whole process of, of selling. Okay. So that brings us to the end of um, the barriers of innovation today. Um, because I uh, have been talking for quite a long time, I'm aware I've gone over the 15 minutes, I'll come back to the questions and, and um, write up the questions that we've had with answers and supply those along with the recording of this webinar after I finish today. So just to reiterate that this is the first in a series of five webinars. So on the 26th of June, we'll be looking at sources of inspiration for innovation, but also looking at the importance of keeping consumers close in order to get those sparks of inspiration. <laughs> And um, registration for all of our webinars can um, be um, conducted through our website. So if you go to mmr-research.com forward slash events, you will see links for all the forthcoming webinars. Great. Well, thank you all very much for listening today. I think a couple of you might have missed the beginning, but we will circulate the recording, so hopefully you can catch up. And we look forward to hopefully seeing you again on uh, next week for the next webinar in the series. Have a lovely afternoon. Thanks. Bye.